So good morning. Uh, I'm Nigel Barmer, Research Director at the Victoria Law Foundation, and both VLF and UCI uh, Law's Civil Justice Research Initiative welcome you to the second session of our forum. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today and recognise their abiding connection to this land, its waterways and community. The office of the VLF is on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and it's my privilege to pay respect to their elders and to all generations of Wurundjeri people who have nurtured this land over 50,000 years and continue to do so. I also welcome elders and community members from other nations with us today. So welcome to the second session of the forum on deregulation of the legal profession, which as we all know is a hot topic around the world. Some brief housekeeping though, only panelists can be seen and heard in this webinar. All attendees' videos are turned off and their audio is muted. Um, but please use the Q&A function to ask questions or upvote other questions. There'll be time to get to these as the session progresses. Towards the end of this session, we'll be posting a link to the third session of the day in the chat function. Feel free to continue on to that session or if we're still going, stick with us here. All sessions are being recorded. So that just leaves me to hand over to our speakers and facilitator. And we're delighted to be joined by two titans of regulation and access to justice. First, Julian Webb, Professor of Law at the University of Melbourne, and second, Rebecca Sandifer, Professor at the Sanford School, Arizona State University. And these two will be joined by the wonderful Emily Taylor Poppy, Assistant Professor of Law at the Irvine School of Law, University of California. So I'll start by handing over to Becky. I hope you all enjoy the conversation uh, and I'll see you again towards the end of the session. Thanks, Nigel. It's great to be with everybody today, whatever time it is, wherever you are, and I look forward to when we're all in one place together in person. Um, the title of this panel is the deregulation of the legal profession. In the US, it's, it's almost more re-regulation, and it's taking three primary forms. So one of those is the creation of new kinds of junior varsity lawyers. So they're, they're independent paralegals who can do some kind of limited practice. It's usually limited in terms of the areas of law that they might be able to work in. So only family or debt and eviction or something like that. It's limited in terms of what they can actually provide to their clients. So all of the ones that exist that have sort of bl blossomed in the United States can give legal advice, but some of them can negotiate, but some can't. Some have some rights of appearance, some don't. Um, the entry requirements to these occupations that's why I call them, junior, one of the reasons to call them junior, junior varsity lawyers is look a lot like lawyers. So uh, folks take examinations on substantive areas of law. They might take ethics or, or character and fitness um, examinations. They might be required to have different kinds of insurance around malpractice. Um, interestingly, some of them are sometimes required to do supervised practice before they can enter into practice, which is kind of ironic because we don't ask lawyers to do that, but they look very much like, like a version of lawyers and the regulation is all on the front end. Um, the, other, the other development that's, similar, that's sort of familiar in that front end regulation model is alternative business structures, which of course have been operative in Australia for much longer. Um, these are organizations in the US context that provide legal services in, in some way, and then they have some ownership or control structure that doesn't, doesn't have lawyers running the whole thing. So it might be external investment, it might be uh, non-lawyer management, something like that. Um, the, these have been actually allowed in the United States in Washington, D.C. Um, in, a, in a limited way for a long time, but the big development in the U.S. is in the state of Arizona, where I'm sitting right now, where for about a year they've licensed alternative business structures. And again, the licensing is on the front end, and it's still very lawyerly in the sense that every alternative business structure that comes in, and there are now 18, has to have a compliance lawyer on staff and on record who's responsible for making sure that uh, the organization behaves appropriately. There's a third development in the US context that's actually really very different. And those are legal services regulatory sandboxes. So there, there are two big differences. One is that in a theory anyways, a sandbox could permit anything. Law practice by people who aren't licensed, law practice by computers, all different kinds of non-lawyer ownership, all mixed up together, however you might imagine that could be. Um, the other thing that makes sandboxes very different is the way that they regulate. So they're a form of evidence-based regulation. Um, and rather than being on the front end, 
you focus on the outcomes, on actual consumer experiences and actual impacts on people who use services, rather than on the form, rather on who delivers them or what the kind of organization is or so on. So in principle, as long as the service delivered meets the requirements of the regulatory space, it could be delivered in any number of incredibly unorthodox ways. Um, so you admit these unorthodox practitioners and then you measure their impacts. And usually you're looking at something like, are consumers actually harmed? Or do consumers actually, concrete really existing consumers actually receive some kind of benefit? And the monitoring is done through requiring providers to submit data. So uh, what services have you delivered? How much did you charge for them? What was the result that the consumer got? And also, at least in the, in the operative sandboxes, so the one that's farthest along is in the US state of Utah, the higher your, the more unorthodox the provider is, the more sort of open to scrutiny its practice has to be. So everybody has to, to submit some kinds of information about their practice, but less orthodox organizations have to open up their work product for audits by attorneys to make sure that it's of decent quality. Um, and they have to open up their, their sort of service model to secret shopping in a sense. Um, Utah Sandbox has been up and running for about 18 months. It has 33 entities, I counted them today, and they've delivered about 10,000 services um, with no evidence of any kind of significant consumer harm. So it's a very interesting experiment that, that really I think creates some amazing scope to do some, some things in a very different ways, in very different ways than we have traditionally done them. One thing to, to sort of keep in mind in the US context is that all of this stuff is very new. So um, I said Utah Sandbox has delivered 10,000, well, more than 10,000 services. Well, there are millions of people in Utah and, and many, many unmet, um, unmet needs. And so that there's not much of a dent being made there yet. Um, as I mentioned, there's only 18 licensed alternative business structures in Arizona. Arizona is a bigger state than Utah. Um, and if you think about all of the licensed paralegal programs around the country that have sprouted up in the past few years, the total number of practitioners of, of newly licensed people is less than 70. Um, so this activity is in very early days in the US, but it does show, I think, a shift uh, to thinking about new ways to give people access to justice. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Becky. I'm not sure why my camera is not coming on. It is, it is, there we go. Okay. Um, there we are, that was just my screen setting, clearly. Good morning, everyone. And I want to, uh, uh, welcome you to, to the session and say that I'm speaking to you from the unceded uh, Wadawurrung Wadawar country in, uh, in Western Victoria, in Australia. I'm going to talk uh, uh, a little bit uh, in, in my few minutes with you uh, to sort of a little bit a different approach from, from Becky's. I'm going to talk a little bit about where, where, where a lot of this innovation conversation in, in regulatory terms actually started because Australia and England and Wales are um, rightly or wrongly considered quite significant in this uh, in in this backstory so I'm going to outline a little bit of where where we've come from in those jurisdictions and, and hopefully offer some brief comments on on what I think are three relatively hot topics around alternative business structures um, access to an impact of unregulated legal services and regulation of platform legal services. I'm not going to go into sandboxing specifically. Becky's done a fantastic job on introducing that idea and what's happening in, in the US in, in, in that regard. But if we, if we look at uh, what's been going on um, in, in those two jurisdictions. Australia and England and Wales are, are often kind of characterised as, and certainly have been characterised in the literature, as the sort of starting point of uh, what's seen as a consumer competitivist uh, trend in legal services regulation. 
Um, in a way, Australia got in there first. It was kind of at the forefront of uh, a sort of neoliberal competition stroke deregulation uh, agenda uh, in the 1990s. And we saw moves in, um, in Australia during the 90s to uh, uh, deregulate uh, really by getting rid of initially of a lot of the early restrictive practices and creating some interprofessional competition in the conveyancing market. And that was followed up by moves to, uh, to broadly co-regulatory regimes. So much more lay representation on, on regulatory bodies and, and moves in some of the bigger jurisdictions into wholly independent um, uh, regulatory organizations. There's some of those then kind of relicensed the professional bodies, the representative bodies uh, back into the system for limited purposes. Um, this was followed up in the early 2000s with changes to permitted organizational forms, not quite ABSs in the English sense, but uh, a big push towards incorporated legal practices. And that's, there's been a big drive in, to incorporation into the Australian legal services market and a less significant scale-wise move into multidisciplinary practices as well. The other kind of set, if you like, the third arm of reform in Australia has been around regulatory harmonisation and moves towards a, a national legal services market. And I think it's worth recognising here, because I know this is quite a relevant conversation in the US, that Australia has long had mutual recognition uh, principles in place, which have prevented some of the unauthorised practice of law problems created by admission restrictions on interstate practices in the US. The problem in Australia was that firms trying to set up nationally faced a high degree of regulatory complexity in terms of facing multiple regulatory regimes. I think someone calculated there were potentially about 55 regulatory bodies that could be involved in the mix if you were trying to function nationally across the Australian legal services market. Now, not all of those were kind of specialist uh, legal profession regulators. And so there's been a significant move since uh, the early 2000s to uh, harmonise uh, law. And the latest stage of that is a thing that we call the Uniform Law Project, which is in theory meant to deliver uh, a uniform system of professional regulation. At some point at the moment, and it's been in operation since 2015, there are still only three states signed up to the two largest in legal services terms, New South Wales and Victoria, and WA is just joining this year. Now, if we switch gear quickly to the UK, you've got, of course, the famous Legal Services Act 2007 that instituted a lot of market liberalisation measures. It wasn't really a deregulatory package, but overall it sought to do about three three things and some of those echoed and copied what was going on in Australia. So you see separation of regulatory and representative functions. Interestingly, the creation of an oversight regulator um, who's been in, in, in lots of ways much more proactive than the uniform law regulator uh, in, in Australia has, has been. Um, a much more segmented regulatory framework. Initially, there were eight frontline regulators. So we saw other specialist and para professions being brought into the common regulatory framework for legal services alongside the big two professions of solicitors and barristers. Um, we've also seen incidental reforms in England to professional regulation by frontline regulators. And the big move there was by the solicitors regulator who introduced principles based regulation in 2011 and, and then adapted that substantially in 2019. The idea of this exercise was to try and reduce costs of regulatory compliance and uh, and enhance consumer and public understanding of the protections that were out there. Um, and also there was a, an element of red tape cutting in the exercise as well. 
how successful all that has been is pretty moot. Um, the other thing that it did was introduce ABSs as a new alternative business structures as a new form of licensed entity uh, and a relaxation of ownership rules. One thing that it didn't change was what in, in England they call the reserved areas of practice. And that's a bit of English exceptionalism relative to Australia and the USA. It's a narrow approach to unauthorized practice of law. And, and in a way, it simply reserves some areas of practice, litigation, probate, certain kind of uh, specialist notarial reserved instrument type of activities and, and a few other things to licensed practitioners. But it does mean a massive amount of legal work in a technical sense in the UK doesn't have to be regulated. And that's one of the first, I think, differentiators when we're looking at the UK market, um, which is that, that potential for quite a large unregulated sector, and, and particularly at the, con, con, at the consumer legal services end, we can, there is data pointing to the idea that up to as much as 50% of, of, of legal services around um, uh, em, employment law, welfare, welfare advice, those sorts of areas may actually be in be being delivered outside of, of regulated services already. And there are quality and related concerns around that. There is some interesting data looking at my other area, my other big area was ABS is looking at that. There's some interesting data that comes out of the UK. Um, the UK's had ABS is technically in regulatory terms since October 2011. There was a fairly slow start. Some of the original approval processes were clunky, uh, complex. There was very wide diversity of take up and no clear patterns about who was becoming an ABS and for what reasons early on. Um, there's been some interesting research done uh, subsequently and I'm gonna just highlight one or two points out of that. Where we are now is in terms of critical mass, there's, there's over 1,100 um, ABSs in England and Wales as of May last year. Uh, and that means ABSs constitute about 10% of the law firm market. The majority of those are existing legal services businesses that are converted to ABSs. Um, They've not been the game changer, I think, is the, is the headline that people were to some extent hoping, or certainly some people were hoping. Um, Legal Services Board research in 2017 pointed to still low level of, uh, levels of external investment in the legal market. Only 12% of ABSs that they surveyed uh, had used, had, had brought in any kind of external finance and indicators were that private equity saw legal services as a, a pretty sleepy market and were not really clear what quite what to do with it. So there's a bit of reluctance on both sides. There is some evidence that uh, ABSs are rather more likely than trad firms to be technological innovators. But overall, the UK Competition and Markets Authority reported in 2016 that there was still very limited innovation across the sector in provision of legal services. And it pushed for further changes around, certainly around things like around information on price, service redress and regulatory status. Um, to help potential customers identify service providers. And that work's been pretty much undertaken in the last four years or so. Um, there's been some disruption of business models through ABSs, and certainly they've been active in high volume commoditized services and have tended to develop into larger entities than the total solicitor firm population. Though we have seen generally, and there's been a range of reasons for that, quite a lot of market concentration in the UK. Um, platform legal services, I think I'm gonna probably finish on this point. So I think it's an interesting one. It's very much where we are now. And I think in terms of what's happening in Australia, it, it's a really interesting um, and and uncertain area. I think 
digital legal services create real potential for regulatory dis disruption. But there are some real barriers in the way. Um, one of the things I think we're seeing in Australia is that regulatory uniformity can be a bit of a recipe for inertia. Um, we've got two challenges there. One is the classic pacing problem with technology. A lot of regulators, and I wouldn't say this about Victoria, but a, a lot of regulators in Australia are still taking quite a wait and see approach to technological innovation. Um, and are also alert to the risks of if we have too much variation of a kind of regulatory jurisdiction shopping. Is that necessarily a problem? The English system, to some extent, was predicated by contrast on potential for competition between regulators. So that hasn't really happened significantly in that jurisdiction. We are starting to see some work on innovation sandboxes in Australia, but one thing we're not seeing yet is a move to platform regulation. And I think platform regulation is potentially the, the really exciting uh, exciting option here uh, in terms of a client where we're trying to deal with a climate of declining access to law. Why do we need um, uh, why do we need regulate heavily regulated legal service providers if we can assure the quality of platforms rather than necessarily the 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 the, 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 the organizations that deliver them and so if we start thinking future wise creatively about um, automated legal advice services then you know if you can get your risk assessment around things like the accuracy of system coding and learning the level levels of transparency, explainability and contestability of your system and manage the risk, i.e. likelihood of negative outcomes and the consequences of those negative outcomes, then, you know, why does automated legal advice need to be managed or utilised within regulated legal practice? And I think that's a really hot topic for us going into the future, but it's not one that's still relatively profession centric as opposed to market centric regulation is necessarily geared to answering. I'm going to stop there and hand over to Emily. Thank you, Julian, and also thank you, Becky, so much for giving us a sense of what's going on um, in different parts of the world. I'm really interested to follow up um, on something that, that comes out of some of your comments, Julian, but, but that also, I think, underlies some of what we're seeing in the U.S. And that is to ask about the ecosystem of stakeholders that help to explain why we see these shifts in regulation. And do you think that that's changing? Do you see a change there? And do you see that um, in, a, in a positive way toward increasing access to justice um, or not? So, um, Becky, perhaps I'll turn it over to you first. I think one of the things that's, that's very different about the U.S. context in comparison to some of the things that Julian is describing is that no one has yet thought, hey, let's separate the representative function and the regulation function of the legal market, right? So lawyers are still controlling all of this in the U.S. context. Um, and the other thing is that we don't have an unregulated sector. We have a prohibited sector, right? We have all kinds of unauthorized practice that's going on that is variously criminal and can be disciplined in different ways. So those, that context is different. So the, the ecology of stakeholders in the, in the United States that's probably changing, um, and this is a change that started a while ago, is tech companies that want to be able to do things like employ lawyers to give unbundled legal services that are residents not in the states where they're licensed, right? So they wanna get over, get, get across um, uh, state licensing rules. Um, there are also tech firms that wanna, I mean, they're more, they're, their stories about what they offer are more optimistic uh, than what they can actually do at this point, but like have a robot that practices law, right? So that's, there's that, and there's money there and there's energy and there's enthusiasm. And so that's a, that's a possible change. What you see in the US though is this weird set of, I mean, you expect lawyers not to like this, right? Because it's threatening, it's potentially threatening their livelihood, but it's it's whole bizarre, unexpected maybe segments of the bar that don't like this. So in the US we have very ex expansive contingency fee lawyering and those lawyers don't like this. Um, 
lawyers who think that that they're that, who basically perform document assembly. So wills and estates, for example, don't like this because that's a very easy thing to automate. But legal aid lawyers don't like it either. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a very interesting coalition of opposition within the profession uh, to to what's going on. And I think probably the biggest push from the outside is from tech money. I'm. I'm not. I don't think I disagree with anything Becky has said there. I think even coming from a, from a slightly different perspective, and and you know, an unauthorized practice of law is 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 a real problem, still in, in 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 both of our jurisdictions. I think, but and so that I think you know this idea of moving towards market based regulation as a, as a as a key disruptor for me is is a really important one i think the legal services board in england and wales would kind of like to be a market based regulator but it doesn't have the jurisdiction and it has to tread very carefully around around that and you can see that that has limitations on the way in in which it engages um Look, I, I've kind of spent my life in this area being, I think, what I would have to describe as a, as a constitutionally happy pessimist. And I don't see a lot of reasons for, 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 for changing that view right now. Uh, there's not enough consumer empowerment. There's, there are a lot of information asymmetries and education gaps that limit law as we currently know it as a solution. We struggle to get enough lawyers to do legal aid, legal aid and public interest work because of the stress, poor remuneration and growing educational debts our young, our young practitioners uh, are having to deal with. And, you know, Gillian Hadfield said it all about the, the, the gravitational pull of, of big law. Uh, in, in, in that respect, uh, in, 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 in terms of having negative consequences on, uh, on, on attitudes to practice in consumer legal services. Um, there's a lot of professional indifference and pushback against opening up the market to alternative providers still, something Becky, I think, was just also, also touching on. And, uh, and, and I mean, government at the moment as well is not helping us get lawyers, frankly, out of the way. Um, I think the, the drives to, without getting too political here, the kind of kleptocratic trends that we're seeing in a lot of governments around the world at the moment are neither about access nor justice. And I think, you know, that the, these bigger systemic problems uh, rather put regulation in the shade and we can't forget them. There's, there's a lot of levers at play here. So a, a, another point or another part or piece of what we also see changing, um, and especially Becky, you mentioned this with regard to sandboxes, is a shift toward thinking about actual consumer harm and thinking about actual evidence-based approaches. Um, and I'm wondering, um, there are lots of ways we could go on that, but one of the things I'm curious about is, um, what, is what do lawyers have to learn from that? You know, is that the future and, and are we going to, are we going to see movement there because of this push toward evidence-based approaches? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think um, one of the things that it's interesting to watch because the regulation of legal services still, is still very much controlled by lawyers and state Supreme Courts in the United States is that those organizations are not really very good at regulating. I mean, that's not what they're there for. That's not how they formed. Um, and so it's challenging for them to understand what evidence-based regulation would be even once they sign on to do it, right? So that's, that's an issue. But one of the things that's super fascinating about the practice of law is that it's still this very traditional kind of intuitive, I know what I'm doing, I can talk to you and figure out how to solve your problem and two different lawyers feel very comfortable telling you two completely different things. Um, whereas medicine has moved towards a much more routinized, checklist-based protocol uh, way of thinking about practice. Um, I think importantly, because medicine is disciplined by insurance in a way that the cost structure of legal practices isn't, isn't really disciplined. Um, so I think, I think lawyers have a lot to learn about ways to have more efficient practice. I think they have a lot to learn. I think most lawyers really do want to do a good job, right, and provide a quality service and not hurt people. I think they have a lot to learn about how to do that. Um, I think they have a lot to learn about how to scale. I mean, they could, 
there are all kinds of things that are made possible here that could help them make more money and have a bigger market share um, if they were willing to give it a try. Um, but so far, they're a little bit shy, I think. Again, I can't disagree. I'm not going to add much because it's not a lot of lot of point. I think I think Becky's nailed it. Um, there have been just to point out. I mean, there has been some experiments with this. So some of the Australian legal services regulators are are trying to move towards a more risk based approach. But I think one of the things they're finding is that it's quite difficult given the kind of nature of regulation. You've got to upset a lot of the regulation apple, apple car to become really risk based and evidence based. Um, the SRA in England did, did try it in quite a big way. They started off with trying to have quite a quantified uh, risk banding model for, for law firms. And it got really hard and too complicated. And you've got to, and, and you know, if you're going to have an evidence based approach, guess what? You've got to have evidence. The se sector is really bad at producing good evidence. It doesn't like sharing data. Um, we, one of the things we pushed for in England when I was doing the legal education training review was a lot more diversity data uh, about what was happening in law firms. It's it's happening, but it's it's not happening in the way or as quickly as we'd like to see it. So if law firms aren't willing to get on board and can't be forced to get on board in data sharing, there's not a lot of money or a lot of uh, uh, in, in, in some of our jurisdictions, a lot of empirical expertise in research in these fields. So we're not necessarily getting the evidence coming in from those sectors either. It's a hard game, but I, I'd love, like Becky, I'd love to see it happening. And I will just plug here that the next session is about making administrative data better. So uh, um, just a little plug to stick around. Um, but related to that too, I think part of it is um, there is also this expertise story and thinking about the many roles that lawyers play. Um, and, and one of them could be more tech development, could be more innovation, could be more data analysis. And those aren't skills we think of when we think of lawyers. Um, and as somebody who teaches in a law school, that's not what you know most of what legal education is about. So do you think there's a room for legal education to lead or nudge at all here? Sh shall I say this one, Becky, first to give you a, a breathing space? Um, yeah, yes, I absolutely do. Um, and I, you know, I acknowledge there's actually some really great, great work. I mean, if you had been the legal tech session before before this one, you know, you'd have been hearing from uh, um, you know, Margaret Hagen and, and other folks about some of the developments that are going there. Um, I do think there's a little bit, a bit too much of an emphasis around, um, you know, coding or, 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 or non-code alternatives uh, as, as kind of the, the sharp end of innovation. And that's not really where it is at or needs to be at, in my view. I absolutely think there's good work that we... And big conversations that we need to be having uh, around legal policy and legal design, which isn't just about agile. It's got to be much more broader than that. Um, in, in, in my background, I, I, a lot of my work is driven actually by a background interest in complexity and influence by work from complex adaptive systems and that kind of theory. And in that sense, you know, if we're thinking about design and we've, we've got to be thinking about you know, institutions, rules, and tools. It's design all the way through the all the way through the system. I think we're starting to get better at picking up on bits of that. In some ways, I think we almost need to go back to the you know the some of the the good bits of the uh, the, the Yale kind of um, legal process, law and policy style thinking, where we're really getting students thinking about the, the big policy issues around these issues trying to do a little bit of that in my own school we teach civil procedure and legal ethics as a combined course it's it's a big ask content wise but what it enables us to do is to take a policy-based orientation to look at how those two elements very traditional professional elements of the curriculum work together and some of the the, the a lot of the unintended consequences when you put those two things together have in terms of legal services uh, and, 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 and access delivery. So there are ways of doing it. We need to be having the big conversations about digital. And I think that needs to be not just about um, uh, legal tech. I think there's a much larger 
concept of what way uh, about the way in which digital is changing the na the very nature and form of law and 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 sort of privatization issues you know rulers code and all those sorts of bigger conversations i think are really really important and areas where as law schools we should be showing intellectual leadership becky anything you'd like to add um i mean i think they're fascinating I know the US context better. I mean, I think there are fascinating things going on in law schools around experiential education, around the kinds of legal design stuff that people like Margaret Hagen are doing. My observation of law schools is that they've been enormously static in what they value in, in the kinds of faculty that they hire and tenure um, in the face of, I mean, I started studying lawyers in 1995 and every 10 years, the American legal profession is beset by a crisis. And yet somehow, Law schools have remained remarkably the same through all those crises. I mean, I think rather than trying to make lawyers the people who do everything, um, the way you get real innovation is by having people who know different things work on a problem together. Um, and so, you know, when law schools start reaching out, start hiring people who are not lawyers, <laughs> and start creating uh, training opportunities that are, that are interdisciplinary, then I think you'll start to see some, some, more, uh, some more institutionalization of interesting stuff. Whereas right now it's kind of on the edges and we really admire those people, but they're not central to what law schools do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we think about where we are right now and where we wanna get, um, we've talked a little bit about this idea of kind of deregulation. Let's go to market-based, you know, reform. We've thought about re-regulation. We're going to regulate, but just in a different way. We've thought about, you know, changing who's doing the regulation. Um, and, and we've thought about kind of moving from a multi-jurisdiction into kind of a national perspective. So when you two think about these options, if you could be king or queen for a day um, and, and just sort of nudge the regulatory system in a particular direction it, that would encourage and expand access to justice, you know, what, what do you think from that broad perspective? Very happy to let Becky have that one. <laughs> <laughs> models that are evidence-based and that generate their own data, right? So that's what a sandbox does. So it'd be wonderful, for example, in the US context to see a federal sandbox. So federal settings already allow um, more kinds of appearance by people who aren't lawyers and more kinds of practice by people who aren't lawyers. So let's, let's expand that and actually measure what it does. And that becomes this wonderful way of learning about what we could permit everywhere, right? Um, I would like to see that. And then it would be harmonized. We'd have a model for explanation. There, done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really genuinely struggle struggle with this one. Um, kind of narrowing it down to just just one. I want more more presence in my uh, in my in my my Christmas sack. Really, please, Santa. Um, I. I, I think for me, I get conflicted around. I, th I think the idea of market regulation for me is is an important one that we've we've kind of got to get. I think we have got to get traditional lawyers out of the way. Um, so I do think the the you know the arguments about creating a lot more alternative legal service providers is one that I think has to be an important part of the important part of the piece. But I'm at the same time I'm also wary of opening up um, a race to, a regulatory or or deregulated race to the bottom because of all the obvious problems of consumer risk. And I thought it was really interesting that Stephen Mason, when he did his independent review of legal services in, in England, came up with a model of regulate everybody rather than obviously regulate nobody. Uh, and I think actually, in a way, that's that's right. So hitting, I, I guess what I'm coming to is my, my, my Christmas gift would be identifying and hitting the sweet spot of regulation. 
And I'll be absolutely honest, I'm not sure yet that, that I, I certainly don't know what that is, and I'm not sure that anyone does. I think it's an experimentation question. And I think the more we can create an, a regulatory environment that enables that kind of experimentation so we can we can come to an evident, evidence-based sense of where that sweet spot might be, then that's going to make a, a dip, that does make a potential difference. I, I'm also curious to get your thoughts in thinking about at the end of the day, how much does any does the regulate regulatory regime in place affect access to justice in the sense that there are lots of pieces to to solving access to justice to expanding it, um, and so how important is it? You know, should it be the number one priority because it's driving so many other things or, or does it come further down the list for you in terms of top priorities of, of thinking about access to justice um, writ large? I, I, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, only fair. Um, I, I don't think, I, I would not put it top of my, top of my list. Um, I, I think, and it, it comes back to complex, that, that whole complexity point I was alluding to earlier. I don't think you can point to any one thing and say this is this has got a tipping point quality for me. Um, and and, I, and it's kind of it's a bit of an intuition. It's hard for me to evidence that. Uh, I'd have to say, um, I think regulation is an important part of the piece. Um, insofar as I think it does create negative effects and external and externalities that we could we could do without and the more we can reduce those then that is that is going to help access to justice um, but at the moment the scale the sheer scale of the lack of access to justice problem the inaccessibility of courts um, the the, and to some extent, the lack of accessible alternative to courts as well. I think those are really, really big scale problems um, and, 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 and lawyer regulation, if we're talking about regulation in that narrow sense, is only a very small part of that pie. At another level, of course, regulation is also everything. Once we take the legal profession out of the regulation conversation as something special and talk more generally about regulation, then I think we have a have a very different um, conversation because it's you know how we organise our regulation, how we how we create rules and structure uh, our our institutions and our roles in relation to those institutions is then a very big question. Yes, I was asking in a small R sense, but you're absolutely right in the, in, I, I don't know which is the big R and which is the small R. Um, you know, Becky, what, what's your thought? I have a somewhat different perspective. So um, I'm not sure it's the only thing I would do, but it's a place I would start. And the reason is it's possible, unlike some other changes that, that might be more difficult to achieve. I think it's really clear that lawyers can't scale and we, as, as, they are, as they are designed in the US, you cannot scale that uh, to, to, a, to achieve act, broad scale access to justice. And so you have to have things that can scale. And part of what makes them scale is also part of what makes them diversify what in the US is still a very white guy kind of a profession um, because it creates many more entry points into providing legal services if you can open up those kinds of things. So. The, the, the body of providers becomes more diverse, but it also then gives more entry points for people, right? It's closer to, it's closer to people socially and physically and economically. Um, and there's no way to get to that in the US structure without changing the way we regulate the practice of law. Can I just chip in there again? Because I mean, it's a, I think it's a really fantastic point, Becky, and, and way more practical and useful than anything I, I said in response to the same question. Um, the, and I think the point does really come home when you look at the, the lack of difference all the regulatory reforms has made to the underlying business model. Um, and, and you're absolutely right about the lack of scalability and the lack, relative lack of diversity still around business models. And I think in some ways, one of the biggest things that's holding the sector back is still the partnership model and the way in which that prioritizes the interests of the people at the top of the organization uh, over both junior workers and 
consumer interests to some extent. Even if we look at what's going on in the new law space, yes, there's some innovation around business models, definitely in the new law space, but it's, it's still not huge. So that touches a little bit on, on actually one of the questions from the audience, which was about thinking about market-based regulation, but the need to kind of understand the market better. Um, and how it's working and where it's not working. So uh, the question from the audience was, what data and research do you think we need to better understand that? So I, I wonder, Julian, if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, um, gosh, it's I'm not sure very good ones. In one of the, it's very clear one of the big problems is One of the big problems is still information asymmetry. Uh, and, and so I think there's a lot of underlying lack of information about, um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm burbling. Let me think. Um, I've mentioned one already. I think, I think some stuff around diversity, I think the issues around diversity and access to justice are interesting. Diversity isn't necessarily a big, at the moment has not been a, had an opportunity to be a big driver for access but i think maybe once we, if we can get a more diversified uh, and particularly in issues like you know ethnically and class diversified profession and start getting some of those interests coming more to the fore those the, the, the way in which those could tr drive different business structures and different ideas in the profession could be really interesting so i think getting you know finding levers around diversity is important um commoditization what's being even just sort of basic information about what's being commoditized and how the kind of different uh, product models that are evolving out there i don't uh, I, I think it'd be interesting um the quality of data we've even got about who is using legal services i think there's room for improvement around that um Becky, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to you because I don't know, I'm conscious we're short of time and I'm sure you've got some great ideas as well. I mean, I think we, we know because of this great set of legal needs or public experience surveys that have been done in a fairly consistent way around many parts of the world, a lot about what people are experiencing and where they're currently going and why they're, some about why they're making different kinds of choices. I would love to see some actual market research, right, by marketers. <laughs> not by people like me, but by people who are trying to figure out how can we get this population connected to this thing that we might want them to buy or use. Um, I think that would go a long way in informing service delivery and informing the kinds of unorthodox businesses that might enter into these new regulatory spaces. And I don't see it. I mean, maybe I'm missing it, but it just seems strange that it's not there. I was once driving in the car and I heard something on the radio about um, an architecture billing futures index. And it was basically an economic index that looked at architect billing because it's a forecaster for new construction. And I just thought, gosh, that's fascinating. What, who's tracking lawyer billing and what is it forecast and what could it tell us about economic activity and rises and falls? And I just thought, you know, what a dearth um, of evidence we have. Um, so, you know, also kind of on the question of evidence, I, I see this other question from an audience member that I, I want to touch on. And the question says, I understand the importance of evidence-based regulation, but does it beg the question of evidence of what? Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts about what should we be measuring when we're assessing the efficacy um, of interventions? That's a that's a great question. Well, and you kind of you kind of cabinet because you said we, we should be assessing the efficacy. Um, I mean, I was trying to a, pick a broad <laughs> word, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think I think one of the if you if you look at the debates about re-regulation in the U.S., one of the arguments is. Do we care about the impact of this on the, this traditional legal profession? Like, is that an outcome that regulators should care about when they think about designing these things? Um, do we care only about the prevention of harm, right? Um, so Utah's position is that basically we just wanna make sure nobody gets hurt. Um, 
Uh, I think another one of the questions is if we're going to do evidence-based regulation of new things, um, and we're trying to understand this ecology of services, we need to be start. We need to start doing evidence-based regulation of old things, <laughs> right? So um, Richard Moorhead has that great work that he did when they were rolling out the, the legal aid changes, where you know lawyers and non-lawyers make material damaging errors at exactly the same rates. It's about 25% of the time. Okay, that, I mean, that needs to be part of the way we think about regulating traditional providers who we only look at now on the front end. Um, but I don't think, personally, personally, I think the thing you're regulating for is access to justice, which I think is a substantive outcome. Is your issue resolved within the bounds of the law that governs that issue? Is that accessible to everybody and is, is it accessible equally? And that ought to be the regulatory objective. That's kind of hard, hard to measure, but um, that ought to be the goal. I don't really care what happens to the traditional legal profession, much as I love certain lawyers. <laughs> Julian, do you have yeah, any other um, thoughts about what do we measure? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I mean, there are ways, I think, in which we look at, you know, the, the, the I think there is a, a kind of quality of outcomes piece. I wouldn't want it to get too, um, too quantified in a sense, but of trying to measure quality of outcomes is, is, is a hard gig. What are your, what are your, what are your, uh, what are your measures? As Becky says, is it just about harm? Is it measure of beneficence? I think if you look at, a, a, you know, Frank, you know, putting it frankly and crudely, the, the, a lot of the work that does come out of the corporate sector, which is great for clients, but it can be pretty rubbish for the rest of us. If we look about environmental harms and everything else, how do you factor things like that into the into the equation? Should you factor things like that into the equation? Uh, I think there's really interesting questions here around regulation and the professions, or indeed the sector's social license that we haven't even begun to really talk about. And, uh, and I think as we start to, to face big existential harms like climate change and the profession's role in relation to that, then I think issues of social license and, and whether and how you measure social license is gonna become a really big and interesting question for us. Which I think I, th I think this will uh, be our probably the last question we have time for. But um, that does lead me back to as we are in this moment where in the U.S. in particular we have just had this um, growing emphasis on racial reckoning in the criminal legal sphere. Um, globally, we're all um, I want to say coming out of a pandemic, but I'm not sure that's accurate. Um, you know, which has laid bare inequalities on, on lots of dimensions, you know, is now a moment for real change um, in terms of regulation in ways that, that could uh, increase access to justice. Is this a special moment? I think it could be. Um, I think there's nothing inevitable about that. I think it requires some work on our part to, to bring the recognition that this is a special moment. Normatively, yes. Descriptively, no. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of interesting, even just looking at some basic issues like back to work. If you if you follow the, the the debates around being back in the office around the legal sector and the way a lot of law firms are are, are sort of cracking the whip to get lawyers back into the office, there's there's the the old the old ways are still are still pulling really really hard in all sorts of ways. There are absolutely massive opportunities for change now, um, but and you know at one level we've got to recognise you know. All, I think you know the level of exhaustion we're all experiencing after two years of pandemic is is something that is probably getting in the way of some of that change conversation as well. But there's, there's how much change can we can we all deal with in the midst of uncertainty? Yes, yes. Well, thank you both so much for being here and sharing your insights. Um, it's so great to have a multi-jurisdictional. Um, approach. And um, I'm hoping that um, some of these themes that we've talked about today will, will obviously come up in other sessions. And so um, I'm looking forward to the conversation continuing in additional sessions. Um, and thank you again so much, Becky and Julian, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so many thanks to Julie and Rebecca and Emily for a wonderful session. We heard a little bit of mention of the importance of evidence currently paired with a shortage of quality data and an inability to see people and data. And as Emily suggested, we, we may find some answers in the admin data session that's about to get underway. You probably all noticed the link in the chat pop up, um, which is your way to that session. You'll also find it in the forum program. And I hope to see you all at that and over, at the other great sessions over the next two days. So thanks again to our presenters, facilitators and attendees. And I hope to see you all in the sessions to come. So thanks, guys.